Hello everyone, you're very welcome. This is my 1974 Volkswagen Transporter, but this particular bus is quite unusual. It is completely original. Well, there have been a few changes made on the inside. But this vehicle has never had any bodywork repairs. All these panels are just as they left the factory in 1974. All of the body, glass, even the window rubbers, all original. The Type 4 engine and the gearbox have never been removed, and this vehicle only has 71,000 kilometers from new. That number is genuine because I put almost half of those there myself. In the world of Volkswagens, you might say it's a bit of a unicorn. But this bus does have some issues that we need to take care of. Just have a listen to this. This engine has not been started for three months. It starts quickly. Ordinarily, this might be a good thing, but not in this case. Once warmed up, the engine idles uncontrollably high and cannot be adjusted downwards. If turned off when warm, the engine does not want to restart. Any time I corner sharply, there's also a strong odour of petrol inside the cab. There are also a number of other issues we will need to examine, so it's best to just remove the engine and take a good look. So, this is the plan so far. Firstly, solve the high idling and starting conundrum. Several things can cause this condition, but I already have my suspicions. Secondly, I'm going to modify the van to run on E10 petrol. Four-quart fuel in Ireland now contains 10% ethanol, which is not good for older cars, so this needs to be managed. Then, servicing the engine. With the engine out of the van, a full service is really easy. We may as well do that too. I need to take a look at the fuel tank itself. I suspect the strong smell of petrol in the cab when cornering is coming from the fuel tank. The only way to thoroughly examine this area is with the engine removed. And finally, Fix the other broken stuff that we don't know about yet, but always seem to find whenever we start these jobs. For anyone who has not seen one of these vehicles close up before, these transporters are powered by an air-cooled engine. Cooling air is drawn into the engine bay via an air intake on each side of the vehicle. An engine-driven impeller then circulates this air where necessary, ducted by a system of metal shrouds. This system makes engine removal less complicated than a conventional liquid-cooled vehicle. Before we start removing the engine, here are some useful assistance. A speedboat fuel tank, a motorcycle jack, and for anyone who has lost their attic insulation, a little hat to protect the head when operating in confined spaces. Running the engine warms the engine oil making it less viscous and easier to drain. I'm sure there is a sect of ninja mechanics somewhere out there in the world that can remove a sump plug without getting any oil on their fingers. But I'm not in that league. The first item removed is the battery. This eliminates the possibility of sparks during the next step, which is draining the fuel. The speedboat fuel tank is low enough to slide in underneath, but large enough to take the van's half-filled fuel tank, all in one go. 
Although it's not necessary to drain the fuel when removing the engine, because I'm changing the fuel hoses anyway, now is a good time to do so. The function of this warm air blower is to circulate warm air into the cabin to provide heat and windscreen demisting. The unit is an electrical fan that pushes air the length of the vehicle via a series of uninsulated ducts with multiple joints. As a result, no heat or window demisting is available. But removing the two 10mm bolts and taking it out of the way creates more space in which to work. With the warm air blower out of the way, the air filter assembly can be easily removed via the quick release clips. This is a paper element type air filter. All of these hose clamps are original, so I will guard these carefully. At this stage, the remaining warm air ducting can be removed. Disconnecting the vehicle wiring is easy, but it is wise to take plenty of photographs before doing so. Documenting where everything goes makes reinstallation much smoother. Now we can easily access the carburetors to disconnect the throttle cable, fuel hoses and remove the four retaining nuts. With the carburetors removed, we can access the two upper engine to gearbox mounting bolts. I've removed the right hand bolt as it also mounts the starter motor on the far side of this bulkhead. I'll remove the left hand bolt when it's time to lower the engine. The starter motor can only be accessed and removed from underneath the vehicle, so I'm doing that now. Space is limited, so removal is by feel. Here however, we encounter our first surprise. While carefully disconnecting the wiring, the terminal just crumbled away from the solenoid. This had been ready to fall off for some time, judging by the amount of carbon scoring from electrical arcing. The good news is the discovery solves an intermittent starting problem I've been having for the last few years. The engine is sealed to the body of the vehicle by a soft foam joint. This seal is essential to prevent exhaust fumes from outside the vehicle entering the engine bay. If this were to happen, not only would the engine re-ingest these fumes, reducing efficiency, but the fumes could also enter the cabin, which we must not allow. In consideration of the importance of this, I will have to replace this item. Removing the foam seal allows access to the screws that retain the metal shroud around the engine. This shroud is sometimes referred to as cover plate or tinware, but it is most definitely made from pressed steel, which due to time and corrosion does not want to release these screws. Some penetrating fluid, heat and patience are required. Hey, what are you doing in there? The three rearmost pieces of metal shroud must be removed to make the space required to slide the engine out. Here we can just about make out the letters I and O, hand painted on the rear left piece. This is a factory production line quality control marking and stands for in Ordnung, meaning in order in German. I'll take plenty of photos as I like to preserve such details. To remove the rear right hand tinware piece, the oil filler neck must be detached by compressing the spring collar. I found duck bill pliers less effective than a conventional combination pliers for this action.
The three pieces can now be removed. Their removal creates the space for us to slide the engine off the gearbox, which does not need to be removed and so will remain in place. I left the fan guard mesh fitted until now to prevent wayward bolts and washers entering the area around the fan. This piece is delicate and worth removing to prevent damage. Although the exhaust does not strictly need to be removed, this one could use a tidy up, so may as well take it off now. This is not a stock exhaust and I will probably replace it with something different in future, but for now it's still in good condition, so it's worth a new coat of paint. The final item here is the exhaust heat shield. This sits just above the exhaust and is an important component as it deflects heat away from the three pieces of tinware we just removed. Without this shield, these panels will heat soak and in turn warm the cooling air being drawn in by the cooling fan. That is not good for engine health. This component has begun to deteriorate, exposing the asbestos filling. I'm not comfortable repairing this item so this will not be going back onto the bus. I will, however, find a safe, sensitive and discreet modern alternative. The final items to disconnect are these heater bellows and controls underneath the van. While down here, the brake servo hose can be disconnected and the throttle cable drawn clear of the tinware. My brother Harry is going to help with manoeuvring the engine out of the vehicle. This is not the first time we've been under an air-cooled Volkswagen, so having experience backup is always good for morale. It's time to introduce the motorcycle jack. The broad platform offers very good stability. I've placed a sheet of plywood between the jack and the bottom of the engine as a sacrificial protection. These cross-member bolts will be removed along with the remaining engine-to-gearbox nuts once the jack is in position to take the weight of the engine. And then the wiggling can begin. The aim of this operation is to carefully move the engine rearwards off the gearbox main shaft. It's imperative that the engine clears this shaft before lowering. Failure to do so will result in destroying a low mileage gearbox, which is unthinkable. Mission accomplished. The engine is now well clear of the gearbox and can be safely lowered away before being withdrawn from under the vehicle. For this, the wheels on the motorcycle jack come in handy. Everything looks good in here, but I can see a thorough cleaning in this engine bay's immediate future. I had previously removed the bumpers because they were looking a little tired and needed a freshen up. Around the same time, I also sourced these original Volkswagen bus wheels, which I will recycle. I want to revert the bus back to a slightly more stock look, so the bumpers and wheels will all be powder coated at the same time. And, as if by magic. But, part two is not going to be about wheels and bumpers. It's going to be all about Der Motor. Until then, Slongafall.